Good afternoon from sunny Hamilton, and thank you for joining us for our conversation with our two presidents, Dr. David Farrar and our MSU president, Giancarlo Dore. It's, um, it's been a busy few months since David and I last checked in. It was, um, I think, early December, David, when we had our last conversation. So I'm not gonna ask a question that says like, what's been new since December, because a whole heck of a lot of stuff has been new. But last week you released your new vision statement for the university. So wondering if you could um, give an update to alumni and friends about that and your next stages, perhaps with your strategic plan. Uh, happy to start with that. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back and I'm speaking with you again. Um, as I mentioned, I've spent the last year in consultation with the community. It started uh, being able to talk to people live and ended up in a virtual cons consultation. But what really um, came out of that for me was a real sense of the um, impact that people want McMaster to have, um, the ambition um, that people have for our university and how they want our university really to be transformative in terms of the way in which we change the world and uh, whether we're talking about uh, climate change uh, or a number of other issues that came up. Um, and there's also a sense that we're going to do that through our excellence, um, through inclusion and through the community that we have. And so that um, th those words form the first part of the vision statement. Um, the other message that came across loud and clear was that um, people really do think that um, our current positioning statement, advancing human and societal health and well-being, really does um, describe uh, the university and what we hope to do. Um, so that frames our vision and what we're working on now is the strategic plan, um, which is a list of, of goals and activities um, that we're going to do in order to achieve that vision. Um, and the metrics, how we're going to measure ourselves. And the big areas um, that we're working on are the areas that are uh, important to public universities. So um, student learning and our teaching uh, uh, lead the way along with our research and our scholarly activities. And um, we're very focused on engaging our communities, um, local and national communities, indigenous communities and um, global communities. Uh, and then uh, a huge focus on inclusive excellence. Uh, and there's a, a, a plan that has been developed um, over the last three years that supports that on which the strategic plan is built and on operational excellence. What are we gonna do um, so that our university provides better support administratively for the um, people who uh, work here, who study here um, and our, uh, our community members. Is there anything that surprised you that came out of the, the exercise for the, the vision statement? I'm, I'm surprised, uh, maybe the wrong word, but I, but I was very pleased um, at the ambition um, that the place has. Um, I was really pleased to see um, how important inclusion has become to our community and the real uh, desire to focus on inclusion. And uh, the people really do recognize that MAC has a, a small number of areas that we're very strong at, uh, and they want us to continue to focus on those areas and to continue to focus on the things that we're excellent in. In other words, not trying to be all things, uh, mm -hmm. but being incredibly good at what we do. So yesterday there was a big announcement at the university about um, our Canada's global nexus for pandemic and biological threats and the University of Saskatchewan and their vaccine and infectious disease organization. Maybe you want to give us a little update on that because that was um, a really big announcement and, and it would help to bring everybody up to speed on what the difference McMaster is making as we tackle the COVID pandemic. Um, so this is something that um, we've been working on for uh, well the 11 months that we've been in um, the situation that we're in. It, it starts um, with our really um, deep strengths, um, as I said before, an area where we're truly infectious and where we're truly um, excellent, and that's infectious diseases. And um, we have deep strengths in infectious diseases and, and also the therapeutics um, that are used to treat those. We have basically our own um, small pharmaceutical uh, company. Um, it turns out we're also strong in vaccines. Um, we're strong in, in um, virology, but vaccines we've been working on for 20 years or more. The Fitzhenry Vector Lab um, was working on vaccines based on something called an adenovirus. 
um, decades ago. And, and it's that technology that is actually um, behind the AstraZeneca um, vaccine. It's the vaccine that Russia used in their um, Sputnik um, vaccine. And so we have deep strengths in this area and it, it starts there, uh, but it doesn't end there. Um, the university really stepped up and did a tremendous amount from our advanced manufacturing perspective on helping um, local uh, industry retool to make uh, personal protective equipment, to make ventilator, ventilators. There are about 50 companies now uh, in the area that are manufacturing locally um, supplies that we need. Um, and, and then it built from there into a number of really interesting areas. Aging, um, we have deep strengths in aging and uh, the effect of the pandemic on older populations has been um, well noted and we're building there. Um, deep strengths in ethical decision-making and uh, the pandemic has resulted in decisions being made about scarce resources, who's going to be admitted mm -hmm. to a hospital and who isn't. So, so ethics has become a part of it as well as supply chain management. And the nexus really, it's Canada's uh, global nexus for pandemics and biological threats. It's meant to bring all of this together as well as um, public health uh, surveillance, of biological threats um, into a university where we won't lose that information. Canada had it in the past and we lost it. And our approach is never again. Um, when the next one comes, we want to be ready for it and we want to be the university that's leading that. And I think it's just, uh, you know, as a, as a Mac grad, it's immense pr pride in uh, our university that we're, we're doing this. So John Carlo, over to you. It just seems like yesterday you were elected MSU president. Little did you know you'd be sending your year um, virtually leading the McMaster Students Union. So how has your year gone? And what have you learned about yourself from your experience as a student, as our student leader? Yeah, well, thank you very much, Karen, first of all, for inviting me here today and uh, inviting me to speak to the McMaster community um, about you know, all, all of our plans and everything that's going on. Like you said, I was elected in January 2020, so that was, you know, a, a good few months before anything um, was announced federally uh, at the university to shut things down, um, stay-at-home orders, uh, social distancing, everything. So uh, it was a bit of a pivot, uh, I'll admit. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I, I thought that uh, having a good amount of meetings before my campaign and before the election would bode me well. And I think it has, uh, but I, I uh, think I underestimated Murphy's law a little bit. Um, <laughs> there's definitely been a lot that's gone on um, that I, that I wasn't, um, that wasn't in, um, you know, my, uh, my plans or, or wasn't something that I envisioned happening this year. There was the pandemic, there was a global uprising for racial justice and calls for equity work in our communities um, that have been continuing. The, I had two out of four uh, of my MSU VPs uh, drop before the end of the summer for various reasons. So we had by-elections for our, our vice president team. Um, we renegotiated uh, HSR contracts for students twice in the past uh, six months. Um, our new MSU president was acclaimed for the first time in at least 40 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just saw that Doug Ford is looking to appeal SCI in March. So, you know, the, the surprises keep coming. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I would say, um, I, I've, I've gained a lot of perspective from this. And I would say I, some things that I've learned, um, you know, rep representing 27,000 students uh, is a very interesting job. Uh, I'm not sure anyone my age is qualified for that. But uh, I think that one thing that I've, I've learned is the difference between uh, speaking on behalf of a group of people and amplifying the voices of a group of people. Uh, sometimes I've learned that my voice isn't always the most important one to listen to, and I can do more by listening than speaking. Um, I also know I'm very ambitious by nature, but you know, I can't do everything alone, and the greatest success comes from teamwork. So the MSU hasn't pushed through the pandemic because of one person. It was a team effort, uh, similar to the university community. Um, and also, I I've learned there's a lot I don't know. Uh, and so while I I've, uh, I've really enjoyed gaining perspective through the pandemic, it's made me excited to learn more about how our communities operate, how our governments operate, um, and how we can move forward as a community. So you have two months left, really, in your term, starting like yep. as of first. So what are you? What are your kind of your big priorities for your last couple of months in office? Absolutely. Uh, so th there are a few things that we're trying to wrap up. 
Um, and, and like I said, the ambition uh, of our team, not just myself, of, uh, of our team, the MSU in general, um, it's, uh, it's hard to contain within two months, uh, but um, we're leading up to transition. Uh, if there's one thing the MSU is good at, it's transition. We do it every year, almost our entire organization. So we have uh, our new MSU president-elect, uh, Denver Della Vadova, that will be beginning uh, in his role May 1st. So I've been uh, doing lots of transition with Denver. That's been a huge priority. Uh, also, uh, a lot of our priority has been on uh, uniting student leaders uh, during a time when it's felt in many ways uh, like we're being isolated or uh, divided. And so that uh, looks very different um, depending on the priority, but we have a, a number of student leaders across campus that are doing incredible work. And uh, sometimes I find that we're all working on different priorities. So we've been having lots of discussions as, as uh, uh, groups of student leaders across campus on how can we uh, better work together to make progress on priorities. Uh, we've had lots of conversations uh, within the MSU and um, uh, across the university as well to advance our equity work. Uh, so we've done a lot of work this year with uh, the EIO on the Census and Student Experience Survey, um, which is a huge step forward for the university to start collecting that uh, demographic related data uh, for student experience on campus. Uh, and we've um, advanced our equitable hiring practices. And so now we're looking at uh, metrics of assessment for equity work, um, which is something that uh, I know the university is looking at. And um, I'm really uh, proud of the MSU to start taking uh, steps in this direction. Um, other than that, uh, as we wrap up, you know, there, there's lots of conversations about what's the fall going to look like? Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of consultations are going into that. So I've been very involved in those conversations to ensure that we have uh, broad uh, consultations of student leaders across campus, of first years that have never stepped foot on campus, um, some of uh, upper years that um, maybe are looking at, at September as their last year in McMaster, and what's that going to look like for them. Um, and I, I would say just aside from that, uh, another big priority has been on mental health. Um, so I know we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit, but um, just looking at the different factors across campus that, that tie into mental health. And, you know, I think traditionally there have been a lot of pushes to uh, increase the number of counselors and uh, make improvements to the Student Wellness Center, for example. Um, but we've really taken a big dive this year uh, with the university to look at how uh, factors of mental health are everywhere across campus and within our community. Uh, it's related to disability, it's related to finances, academics, um, uh, your home life. It's related to so many different things. So trying to advance some of those priorities uh, to support students going uh, into the exams, into the summer and uh, coming back next year. Great. So I'm going to bring David in for this question. This is a joint question for the two of you. Um, we know McMaster is a very special place, but one of the things that McMaster has enjoyed um, and continues to do, uh, a very collegial relationship with our student leaders. So David, you've worked at a number of Canadian universities, so I'm going to ask you this part of the question. Why do you think that is and what makes it work? Uh, so I don't know why, um, why that is. Uh, I know that uh, the senior administration um, of the university, so the president and the vice president, meets on a regular basis with the president of the MSU and the vice president in the MSU, as well as part-time students and um, the graduate students. And, and so there's a, um, there's a regular agreed to um, set of meetings that allow us to discuss the issues that are coming up. And I think that uh, communication and the willingness to approach it in that way is a big, um, is a big help. Um, you're right, I've worked at a number of very, uh, of other Canadian large um, well-known universities, and it's not that way at those universities. The administration and the students don't tend to meet together and the relationship isn't um, as good as it, it, as it is at Mac. Um, I'd be interested in, uh, what Giancarlo thinks is the reason why it's that good. Uh, Mac in the beginning um, was a small regional university and uh, it may have grown out of that small regional university, um, but we're now a large global university and yet we still seem to have, uh, have been able to keep that. So I'm, uh, I'm curious on, uh, on how Giancarlo thinks that uh, that's come about. <laughs> yeah, uh, happy to, to jump in here. I, I, I first wanna say, I think that, um, you know, there wouldn't be that healthy relationship without um, my predecessors uh, who have sustained those relationships for a very long time. And also on uh, university stakeholders, David, yourself, uh, VPs, provost, vice provost, um, academic uh, uh, leaders across campus um, that have been willing to 
keep that that open dialogue. Um, and I think we've had a very healthy relationship, uh, at least over this year. And I've heard over previous years. Um, I've heard at other institutions. I'm very close. A lot of my peers across Canada that that have similar roles, and it's not the same. Like David was saying, um, oftentimes um, there can be uh, very aggressive relationships between um, student groups and uh, university institutions, and um, that can sometimes get a little bit messy. Um, so I think that we have a very healthy relationship. We don't always see eye to eye on topics, and I think that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the open communication is what's important. Um, I've always told David um, that you know it was my job to represent students, and uh, whatever you know students are pushing for, that will be what I'm bringing forward and, and trying to amplify. Uh, and you know I'm allowed, I'm able to do that because um, the university is willing to to meet with us. So. Um, I, I think it's, you know, huge applaud to the university for, uh, like David said, having those, uh, those quarterly meetings with us uh, and the grad students and part-time students across campus. Um, we have frequent conversations throughout the year as well on, um, uh, you know, major concerns of students and major priorities of the university. But uh, I would say that healthy relationship is just built on open communication and willing to, to have uh, an open dialogue which I think is really important, especially in an increasingly polarizing year, uh, world. Um, we were just chatting before this about how it uh, we, we see in social media a, a lot um, these polarizing spheres of uh, debate, and you know I think that debate is really healthy, and I think that that's you know the basis of our democracy in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, it, it has to have open communication, and so I think that that's been a huge part of it. Well, you know, I think it's a commitment from both sides, from all of us who work with our students and uh, to, you know, we want to make McMaster the best place that we possibly could. And it would never happen unless the two groups work together. So you touched on a little bit about uh, mental health with Giancarlo. So I'm going to ask you and David, like this has just been a challenging year for um, the pandemic has certainly raised issues around mental health. Um, so I wonder if each of you could speak to a little bit about um, what the university is doing to support students and Giancarlo, I'm from a, a McMaster student from a long time ago, the MSU did not have as many robust services that they do now um, supporting students. So I think it'd be once David answers, maybe you can jump in and give a little update on that. Cause I think people would be interested to learn how much the MSU has grown in, in supporting our students in some of the services. David, over to you first. So universities are um, challenging places to be um, even when we're in normal times and we've been in anything but normal times. And uh, you know, I have not uh, in the last three months um, really left the, the house I'm living in. So, you know, <laughs> no, no haircuts, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just the nature of the world that we're in that it's, it's incredibly um, anxiety producing and, and it has created a lot of, of mental health and everything and all the supports we're delivering um, in many ways are virtual. And so we have a program called Archway um, and what most students have commented on is that they value the relationship um, that they have uh, with a, a mentor. So our first year students are all assigned a senior year student um, as a mentor, and, and that apparently has worked really well. Um, the faculties um, connect in uh, regularly um, with students using uh, virtual, uh, virtual tools. A lot of online counseling around um, academics, that, that's all happening online as, as well as student well-being. All of our student well-being offices um, uh, are functioning online. Um, there is a knowledge that uh, mental health and physical health are linked. And so we are also um, pushing out um, fitness classes and, and other things to help students. Um, we hope um, that we'll be reopening parts of our university soon and, uh, and that um, students will be able to come back and use some of our facilities. But, um, but until we get through the vaccination stage and we see what the, what the new variants of the virus are doing, um, we're still gonna be living through this. Yeah, Giancarlo? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'll quickly add on a few things um, that are maybe a little bit more macro scale, and then I'll look at um, some things that the MSU, like you said, is specifically doing. Uh, mental health has been, you know, one of our top priorities this year across the board. Uh, when you when you look at our advocacy, we have uh, very strong provincial federal advocacy. Uh, it's it's our top priority. Um, with provincial advocacy, it's one of uh, one of four top priorities, and with federal advocacy, I think it's one of three as well. Uh, so. We've been doing a lot of uh, pushing this year for uh, increased supports from our government. 
Um, we've also been uh, working very closely with the university uh, on, uh, there's a new mental health and well-being task force um, that's working on creating short, medium, and long-term recommendations uh, for Susan Tai, the provost, uh, to build a structure at the university that better supports uh, staff, faculty, students with regard to mental health. And uh, I'm happy to be a part of that. And I look forward to the recommendations coming out. Uh, internally with the MSU, we have a number of peer support services, first of all, that do a lot of really, really great work uh, in creating uh, spaces uh, for students, um, many of them uh, uh, specific to uh, student identities. Um, but just, just in general, the shift that our part-time uh, MSU employees, full-time students have done to completely shift these peer support spaces to an online world in the past eight months uh, was uh, absolutely incredible. And it's, it's helped to create a lot of these communities where students can be themselves online. Mm -hmm. um, a, on a larger scale, the MSU, we have our student assistance plan. So a number of benefits through something called Real Campus. Uh, so it's no cost uh, to McMaster students. It's free, confidential, voluntary, uh, and accessible to McMaster students, roommates, uh, family members as well. 24-7 uh, multilingual calls, chats, texts, uh, and it does uh, mental health support, um, professional consultation on areas of nutrition, academic success, life skills, legal affairs. So we've done a lot of promotion of this as well. It's something that all McMaster students have um, through the MSU that um, been trying to promote it as best we can this year. I think it's a huge step. Um, and there've just been so many ongoing conversations as well um, with the uh, Student Services Advisory Committee to see how can we use additional funding to improve mental health supports on campus. So it has been a, a nonstop conversation all year. So um, whenever we do these events, we ask people to pre-submit questions. So I'm gonna run through some questions that alumni have sent in before. And thanks to everybody who sent in questions. We probably won't get to all of them, but we'll, we'll do our best. So I'm gonna start off one for the both of you and I'm gonna kind of combine um, two questions. So. Um, Ram is from the class of 1998, posed this question all about, you know, like the global world, rapid gene, converging cultures, future challenges. And then Brenda from the class of 1966 asked us, what are your thoughts on how this time will change us going forward? So knowing the big um, issues that are happening in the world, David, you know, and then what's happening at McMaster, how do you think this time is going to change um, for McMaster going forward? Um, so, I, I, so what, what's really happened uh, in the past year is um, we've learned how to use, um, use this technology. So that changes the use of both um, time and space. Um, lectures uh, on this technology don't need to be um, 15 minutes and then you go to another, um, another classroom. And so, um, so how we use our campus has changed in a big way. How we deliver um, content versus um, how we have conversations and provide experiential learning environments have, have changed as well. And so I think the technology is going to uh, make a big change in terms of our rethinking of how we use our campus and what the learning environment looks like as we go forward. And we have a, um, a task force on Carlo mentioned that um, looking at, uh, at getting back to campus, but it's also asking that question. And that is what's been good about this experience and what should we keep and what will it look like when we get back on campus? So John Carlo, you're the youthful member of this panel. So what do you think it's gonna change for us going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that the university community has taken a number of steps uh, moving forward with regard to the university ecosystem being more student-centered, more equitable, more sustainable, research-driven. Um, and I think that while the pandemic, okay, I said, has separated us in a lot of ways, uh, it's also brought us together in a number of ways and it's helped us to see the gaps in our society that need to be filled uh, and that have existed for a long time, but maybe have gotten a little bit larger because of the pandemic. And so I think we've started to deploy more resources to, to try and fill those gaps, but those gaps aren't going away after the pandemic. And so I think that everyone has kind of acknowledged that we need to keep putting more resources into those gaps to, to keep moving our, our uh, ecosystem forward. Uh, and, and with regard to converging cultures and uh, future challenges, um, yeah, I, I think that um, one example, you know, we've seen that I mentioned earlier are, are the stronger calls for more equitable and just society uh, around a time when we've seen a lot stronger and more frequent calls for climate action. And there are a lot of intersections between those two futures. Uh, we've seen plans for Green New Deals that aren't just looking to get our CO2 equivalents to zero. They're also looking at building a more just society in, in the process. So 
I think we're all generally moving in the right direction, but uh, there's not always agreement in how we get there. And we need a little bit more trust in general, I think across society, more unity in the process so that um, we're not leading towards a future that's more polarized. Um, I think that'll be a big challenge for us, but uh, I have faith in our society. Well said. So one of the practical things is there's still construction going on on campus. Um, we may not be there um, to see it, but there are some new buildings that are being built. And uh, Charles from the class of 1983 asked about a few of them, but I'm going to focus on just two to see if each of you could just give a brief sort of um, update um, on what's going on um, with these projects. So David, maybe an, uh, could you provide an update on the McLean Center for Collaborative Discovery? Um, so the McLean Center is the new uh, center that's going to um, support the learning environment for the students um, associated with the DeGroote School of Business. Um, but the first thing that's um, special about the building is that the idea that, um, that business students learn um, when they interact with other students is an important part. And so um, the idea is that this is going to be a space for all students uh, and that conversations around um, the issues that the business students are looking at will happen in this space. It's not going to be a building that has faculty offices in it. Um, the, all the registrarial um, and student support for the university will be uh, for the university students um, will be in that space. Um, so it really is a space for students, and um, it's meant to provide students with the ability to learn in, in, in an experiential environment to learn with their colleagues. Um, they're not going to be uh, classrooms in the same sense. It's going to be much easier to reconfigure the building. Um, smaller spaces can become bigger spaces, um, but, um, but it really is at its core um, a, a, a center for students to learn in. And it'll be right beside the existing um, DeGroot um, School of Business building built on top of what used to be um, the English Library. Mm -hmm. So looking right across from there, um, John Carlo, it's almost like a second student, um, McMaster student mm -hmm. uh, uh, center. So the, what can you tell us about the student activity building and how's that going? Yeah, well, I can tell you, it, it has a name now, a formal name called the hub. So that's um, how most people have been uh, referring to, which is exciting. Um, unlike the, uh, the, new, uh, the new center across the way, um, this is a non-academic space, so primarily a space for, you know, a social space for students, study space, lounge space, uh, lots of prayer rooms, uh, community kitchen, uh, meeting space, uh, very large multi-purpose uh, rooms, and so there's four levels. It's, it's pretty large. Um, there's been a lot of work being done on it. Most of the work will be done by this time next year, February 2022. And the earliest possible opening they're looking at right now is April, 2022. So that would most likely look at a, a large opening for students in the September of 2022. Um, but very exciting. I'm looking forward to coming back to, um, to, to tour through it when it's done. Yeah, it's gonna be a fantastic new addition to the university. Um, David here, you know, you're, you're a chemistry um, professor. So here's a question from Edward from the class of 76. How's lab work working for science students handled in virtual settings? Uh, it, it, so it's interesting. In, in some cases, it's not working. And so um, Giancarlo uh, and I uh, are both uh, chemists. Um, second year organic chemistry labs aren't operating. There's just, um, there's just no way to, um, to do that in this environment. Um, first year biology labs are operating. Uh, all the first year students got a little box um, with some instructions in it, a little bit like the meals that you get uh, to prepare over the course of several weeks. Um, in this case, um, it came with a lab coat. It came with a, a microscope that is uh, um, a cardboard microscope with plastic lenses with a whole series of things and the uh, reagents they, they need are all available um, in the house. Um, so um, some students uh, we've shipped labs out to. In other cases, we've had to um, put labs off. Um, some students have ended up in virtual um, labs as well. So if you're uh, working in some areas, you can use the gaming technology to have students work together and solve a problem. And, and then you can um, use 3D printing and robots to do um, all sorts of cool things to allow them to, um, to prepare um, what they visualized. So Giancarlo, I went back and looked at your platform um, mm -hmm. for your platform points. And I pulled out a couple. So I'm gonna ask you this question. Climate change and the student experience were two of your, I think you had four or five in your platform. 
Um, what have you focused on considering the pandemic for those two priorities that you had? Yeah, this was uh, very pre-pandemic, um, but a lot of those priorities, I'm very happy to say we have made a lot of progress on and still have been huge priorities for the MSU and students. Uh, so I'll start with uh, student experience. Uh, this has been uh, very different than everything that I've, I've known the traditional student experience to be. And so a lot of uh, this work has uh, been through uh, open communication, uh, open channels of communication with students so that I can, I can know what's going on so that um, I can help um, advocate for a, a better um, undergraduate experience. But a lot of this has looked at uh, accessible academics uh, it was it was uh, kind of ironic. I um, one of my platform points was to have more Equa 360 in in courses, and then before I even started, David had kind of rung the bell and said everything must be online next week, and <laughs> so that was checked off before I even started. That was great. Um, David was really helping me out. Um, but but uh, it, you know even when everything moved online, naturally there were problems with that. So there have been lots of conversations about proctoring software. We've been it's been a, been a big uh, focus for us. Um, international student perspectives. Uh, international students are um, very uniquely affected in the pandemic. And so one thing that I noticed before I started was that there wasn't a really a great foundation to hear international student perspectives and realities when we're making decisions. And so uh, I've worked really closely with the SSC this year to try and figure out how we can do that long term. And so it's turned into a task force for this winter that um, we're trying to turn into an advisory council long term that can answer questions that maybe when the university is looking at, hey, what's fall 2021 gonna look like? They can bring that question to um, the uh, International Student Task Force or Advisory Council, which would be really helpful. Um, I've talked about mental health support before, so I won't touch on that too much, but um, clear communications has also been huge for students. There's things changing every day. And one of the biggest things that we can do is just ensure that students know what's going on. They need to know, uh, should I be signing a lease right now? Uh, should I not be? Uh, these are all uh, big questions from students that have big impacts. And so a lot of it just boils down to communication. And then on the climate change side, uh, I'm personally very, very passionate about climate change. Um, I was working with David very early in my term to figure out, um, you know, what, what does David envision for a more sustainable future McMaster? How can I assist in that? Uh, and so I've been working a lot with uh, the AVP um, uh, facilities and Chief Facilities Officer Debbie Martin to try and advance uh, structures of support for climate action goals. Um, I've been trying to uh, uh, guide students to learn how they can get involved. There's a lot of really passionate students, uh, but sometimes they don't know the best place to put their efforts. And so it'd be really great if we could uh, create systems so students knew, oh, you know, the university is trying to do this. I can just feed that into my year plan for my club. And then we're, we're, we're driving that passion, that ambition towards something that um, the university is trying to, uh, to bring as a goal. Um, on the topic of divestment, this was a, a huge piece yesterday. Um, at the, the Carbon Town Hall, the MSUs voiced our support for divestment, um, I believe starting last spring. So uh, I'll just reinforce some of those voices um, uh, yesterday that, that were um, calling for you know, um, divestment as soon as possible. Um, we, we agree we're pushing for that as well. Uh, and we're trying to do that internally as well with the MSU. Uh, we don't just wanna talk the talk. Um, we're trying to also ensure we're, we're um, you know, uh, seeing our own advocacy in our own actions. So making sure the MSU is also doing our part. Uh, and then the last thing I'll just add is uh, I'm spearheading a national campaign to see what are undergraduate uh, um, experiences and, and thoughts regarding um, climate action. And so I think we have just under a thousand responses right now, but it'll um, support a lot of our provincial and federal advocacy going forward. So that's really exciting. Um, but yeah, been a busy time. It has been a busy time, but I think from both you and David, our viewers can take away the word of ambition. We have great ambition at the institution. So as we come to the almost the end of our time, I'm going to do a couple of rapid fire questions, which everybody always likes to know. So, okay. All right. I'm going to start off with David. David, you ready? What are you watching or streaming right now? Um, so Susan and I are watching uh, the uh, morning show on Apple TV right now, which is uh, an interesting piece. I didn't think I was going to like it, but it turns out the characters are really complex and it's evolving in interesting ways. Not quite sure where it's going. Okay. Um, John Carlo, one song that best describes your time at McMaster? Uh, Rise Up by Andra Day. It's, uh, it's a great song. It's about uh, you know, experiencing challenges and, uh, you know, just um, continuing to overcome barriers and, uh, you know, when challenges go in front of you, just got to rise up. All right. 
Uh, David, your prediction on how the Blue Jays will do this year? Uh, so I think we're a few years away from uh, being there at the very end, uh, but I think we may be a wild card team this year. And, uh, you know, if you make it to the wild card, if things play out, who knows? All right. Uh, John Carlo, what book are you reading right now? Uh, it's, it's a great book. It's called Hood Feminism. It's notes from the women, white feminists for God. It's by somebody named Nikki Kendall. It's a really great book. I would suggest that others look into it as well. Okay. Um, David? Your favorite cookie? I have a huge um, sweet tooth. It's uh, whatever I'm eating right now, which happens to be the uh, ginger snaps. Gin oh, I have some ginger snaps at my house as well. They're delicious. All right. Um, GC, your favorite place to eat on campus? I'm going to go with 1280. I got to go with uh, the <laughs> tofu scramble wraps. Um, I miss them. I haven't been in Hamilton in a few months, but um, got to go with 1280. And... Uh, David, what talent would you most like to have? You know, I wish I spoke multiple languages. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the world is, uh, is there for, for us. We have a huge international student uh, body now, and uh, I love to visit um, universities around the world, and uh, I wish I spoke languages, more of them. Uh, GC, your last one, uh, your favorite memory of McMaster. Uh, my favorite memory has to be during my fourth year. I had a house of seven people. The house is made for five people, but there were seven Cambio uh, fourth year students. Um, and uh, we every month we had family dinners where we played board games in the basement instead of writing our thesis. So I would say that that was uh, one of my favorite memories. All right, and then a combined one. So one of the most controversial questions we ever asked, we have this question of the week club that alumni, there's almost 2000, over 2000 members of the club. And this was a very controversial question. So I'm gonna ask both of you, pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Giancarlo? Absolutely not. Oh. <laughs> David? I, I'm, a, I'm a traditionalist. I, you know, a thin crust, a, a sen, uh, um, Maria, Maria, um um, tomatoes, uh, you know, just a classic um, uh, pizza. Well, you know, the Hawaiian pizza was created in Canada, and I do like a, an occasional pineapple pizza myself. But on that note, since it's Friday, it's a good time to have pizza, and it's been a busy week. I want to thank uh, both of you for joining us for this conversation. I think all of us have had an opportunity to hear um, some of the successes and challenges we've had over the past year, um, both of your takes on leadership and how you've led um, our organizations, and are, we're very deeply appreciative of that. And uh, now we know a little bit more about you. And uh, I think we're all looking for spring training because it also, you know, means that spring is just around the corner. So uh, thanks for alumni for, and friends for joining us this afternoon. You'll get a, a survey um, to give us your feedback. And of course, please look at um, our website or read our emails. There's always more events coming. So on this Friday afternoon, we're going to say goodbye from, from Hamilton. Bye, everybody.